today we'll talk about the project Ilbuster, fighting illegal content. What is illegal content? Well, the definition is quite simple, but if we try to give examples, there's just so many possibilities. Simple examples, phishing, sale of counterfeit merchandise, child sexual abuse materials. Okay, a short digression. Uh, most media use the term uh, child pornography. As you can see, we don't use it. We use child sexual abuse materials. In case you wonder why, it's not exactly the same. Almost, but not exactly. This term is much better defined because child pornography suffers from the same problem as, uh, as pornography itself. How do you define it? It's quite subjective. Uh, this is defined much better, but it isn't a wider or narrower term. It's slightly different. Simple example, a drawing of a five-year-old five having sex. Well, it's not child sexual abuse material per se, unless it's uh, visibly a recognizable child, a concrete child, or if it was, of course, drawn from a live model, then obviously, but if not, well, it's it's not exactly this, but is it child pornography? Well, it is pornography and it involves a child. So as you can see, this is not exactly the same. This term stresses the fact that a child was abused. Uh, other, not, not just children can be exploited. We, can, uh, we have the problem of uh, X photos put on the internet for revenge or for money or for whatever. We have many different threats, malware of all kinds, Trojans, uh, drive-by downloads. And we have different things like hate speech, which gets differently defined in different countries. Uh, we have direct threats against someone, they can be illegal. Terrorism, so plans for building a bomb at home may not be legal to publish. That's obviously not the full list. So what is common for it? Well, the definition is very simple. Illegal content is whatever the law defines as illegal, period. Nothing more, nothing less. We don't consider illegal contents something that uh, we think shouldn't be on the internet, but the law does not say so. Just because you don't like it doesn't make it illegal. And the other way around, just because the law in your country says that something is illegal doesn't mean it makes sense. Perhaps it's, for example, illegal to publish any criticism of the governing party. Well, it can be illegal in your jurisdiction. Does it make it okay? Not necessarily. So the definition, is very concrete, but very wide and very jurisdiction specific. There's no global standard on uh, illegal content on the internet. Sure, there are some things most countries agree on. For example, that the child sexual abuse material is something wrong and shouldn't be on the internet. But the definition of that in the law of different countries can be different enough that a certain case in one country will be okay in the other, not. Take the example I gave you explaining the difference between CSAM and child pornography. A drawing of a five-year-old having sex. In some countries, it will be perfectly legal, precisely because no child was hurt while doing that. Other countries fight pedophilia the other way and mm, want to ban anything that might uh, incite the fantasies of pedophiles and heighten the risk of some child getting exploited. In that case, that drawing will also be illegal content. So, another thing, there are no other common traits. Either from the uh, technical standpoint, you won't find one algorithm that will uh, detect anything illegal, because it may, it may be a program, it may be a text, it may be a picture, a video, whatever. And from the legal side, it's also very different. For putting that illegal content on the, on the web, 
you can get a small fine or life imprisonment, depending on what it is and where you are. Another important difference between different classes is the scope of liability. This is extremely important because this affects us as people interested in protecting the world. Since liability is associated with different things in different cases. Take uh, internet piracy. Just because you downloaded something from the internet, which you shouldn't have perhaps, and just because you have it on your disk doesn't make you a criminal, depending of course on the jurisdiction. Doesn't need to make you a criminal because the law prohibits making it available, prohibits uh, distribution. So the person who sent it to you or put it on the server is breaking the law. You aren't, as long as you don't share. And that's the problem uh, uh, with BitTorrent, since most clients automatically share farther and people not always know that. And that um, makes you a criminal as well. But uh, contrast this with, uh, okay, let's use a simpler term, child pornography. In this case, in many jurisdictions, the case is different. The person who put it on the network is obviously a criminal, sure. But if you have it on your disk, when the police raids your house, when they found child pornography on your disk, you are in trouble. No one is going to ask whether you distributed it further or not, because the law clearly say, uh, says that possession is a crime as well. So scope of liability may be different, and that might, uh, might make you available if you're trying to act as a vigilante, f finding illegal content and reporting it to the police. Sure, it's a good thing to report to the police anything you found, but if that's your mission, then perhaps you're collecting on your disk something that you shouldn't have there. So be careful. There's also a question of priorities. Some kinds of illegal content are actively fought. Some are not such, so much of a problem. In any, in any case, mostly due to the liability problem, fighting illegal content is a task for law enforcement agencies and mostly law enforcement agencies alone. But can they do it well? Not so long ago, the answer was clear, no. The internet was a relatively new thing. There were some laws passed that made some content illegal, but there was no experience how to fight this. This is a slightly different world than that of standard crime. Nowadays, it's not so bad, but uh, the law enforcement agencies still do not have sufficiently good tools to fight all kinds of illegal content. As we've seen, there are so many kinds of it that in some cases, the agencies are quite effective. In others, they don't have the tools. So, there are three problems here. One is the detection. Human reporting is not enough. Uh, depending on the kind of content. For example, again, child pornography, pedophiles are not idiots. They know what they do is illegal and they're not going, in most cases, not going to put that on a, uh, that kind of content on a web page visited by thousands of normal people. They won't risk getting reported. So they share this type of content in a rather closed societies, which means that anyone who is a member of that is unlikely to report that. <laughs> and it's not very likely that you will stumble upon something like that, at least not likely enough. Not likely enough that we can consider human reporting sufficient source of information. Uh, of course, detection heavily depends on the type of illegal content. You need different methods, different algorithms to find malware child pornography, illegal text of any kind. One thing we can do automatically and effectively is URL gathering. Suspic finding suspicious URLs is easy. They are in spam, 
they are on different fora. The law enforcement agencies can easily find places where such URLs are published, and that's a good source of URLs. We can have as many as we as we want. Sure, except the level of noise is horrendous. Dead links, links to legal material, and things like that mean that manual processing of such large-scale uh, automatic gathering results is not feasible. So we can do it, but it's not very useful. The second problem we have to solve is what exactly is illegal? In some cases it is simple, in some cases not quite. Again, child pornography. What do we do if the person on the picture is actually an adult, say a porn actress, who actually got paid for it and is very happy that she made those photos, except she looks like a 12-year-old. Is it illegal? Is it legal? This is difficult. This is not something that an automatic algorithm could possibly hope to resolve. Each case must be inspected by appropriate people. And both false, false positives and false negatives are a big problem. False positives with insufficient uh, detail in court may get someone in jail for doing nothing wrong. False negatives, well, in case of some of that illegal content, are a problem, are a problem because, for example, we didn't protect a child who we could protect. One thing we can do, for example, with automatically gathered URLs is blocking. Sure, this is easy, just blacklist everything. But there are a lot of problems. What does it solve? It doesn't block everything but it blocks a lot of things that are false positives. And so we get to the third problem, controversy. Any time that a government and law enforcement is in, in some sense a part of government, any time a government does something to filter content on the internet or anywhere else, there's always that deep suspicion, at least in the, in the Western world, that we like our freedom of speech, and are, there per are they perhaps trying to push censorship under the think of the children flag? So there's nothing, no better solution for that than that we have found than transparency and due process. Basically, you have to know how the police works, and you have to make, make sure that in each case there is a well-documented process of finding out that, yes, this content is illegal due to this law, and that's why it was blocked. If you don't do that, it's very easy to just push things into the blacklist. Okay, so with these problems, we come to the idea of Illbuster. We want to make a tool for the law enforcement agencies that will help them fight illegal content. Point number one, we won't catch all illegal content, and we don't want to try to. First, because it's too jurisdiction specific. Second, because um, in some cases it's, it's disputable. Do we want to help some governments fight their oppositions? Not necessarily. And uh, also, we want to focus on things that we actually can, de uh, can detect. We don't want a long, five-year-long research project that will think of methods to perhaps detect something that is currently undetectable. We want to make a tool, make it fast, uh, develop it, train the users, and deploy. So we have to focus on things for which we already have an idea how to, how to detect that. So we focus on four different kinds. Child sexual abuse material, malware, phishing, and counterfeit mer uh, merchandise focusing on drugs. Illegal drug sale is, is a problem not just from the financial point of view, but it's a threat to human health and life potentially. What do we want to do? Detect, report, and then su support the inspection, nothing more. We don't do the blocking part, the reaction part, however you, dis uh, however you dis define it. And we don't do the inspection for the law enforcement 
agencies, they have to do it according to due process rules. So let them do it. We're just going to help them a bit. We just do the first step. We accept URLs from various sources, actively search for malicious networks. That's something I will talk about a bit later, and did you know we'll talk about at length. Uh, we search for malicious networks to gather more URLs in case, in case the sources we use are insufficient to keep the system fully occupied. And for all the URLs that we find we want to visit, automatically assess the content, and if we think it's, it's probably illegal, report it to the law, uh, law enforcement officer at the console, who will do the rest, verify that, that it really is illegal and start the process, finding um, the criminals or whatever. Third assumption we made was that if it's going to, to be used by law enforcement, it has to be regulation compliant. So we assume legal supervision from the start of the project. On every step, we have legal personnel looking at our results and suggesting changes and so on. If anything seems potentially hazardous. Nothing more. So, the project is funded by DG Home uh, as part of the Prevention and Fight Against Crime program. Uh, sorry, of course, not February 2013, no, February 2014. We started this year. My bad. The project takes only 24 months, and as I said, we want to develop, train, and deploy, so it's a rather short project. Uh, the consortium consists of four main funded by the EU uh, mm, units, uh, with the coordinator, Università degli Studi di Cagliari, do I say it? Cagliari, okay. He'll say it. <laughs> and also it includes Università degli Studi di Milano, better? Okay. Uh, Naukowa and Akademicka. <laughs> Naukowa i Akademicka Sieć Komputerowa, or Research and Academic Computer Network, if you prefer. So, us. And NetClean Technologies Sweden. Also in the consortium, Polizia di Stato and Guardia di Finanza, in other words, potential users who will be with us in the last part of the project to actually use the system and perform testing. And consultants, University of Georgia and Tehend Law Center. This last part is important because they do the legal consultations for us. Okay, and... Whoa, I need to speed up. Okay, uh, this is the general architecture of the system. I won't talk about the details because they will be covered in later parts, but uh, basically we have different sources of URLs from the law enforcement agencies, whatever they have. It's just a list of URL, uh, of URLs, who cares where it comes from. The blacklisted URLs from the N6 platform operated by NASC. And also our own source, basically something that detects malicious networks, mostly focusing on fast flux behavior, and something that finds URLs hosted there. These URLs are processed through us, through our queue and so on. This is basically a honey spider network setup, uh, which includes a high interaction client honeypot for finding um, malware, also a low interaction client honeypot for checking other URLs because this is costly as we know, so uh, most URLs only go through low interaction. But since low interaction client honeypots also down download content, we can put other modules here. So we have phishing detection, counterfeit pharmacy detection, and since the content is downloaded through a proxy, everything that we download that might be uh, child sexual abuse material will get tested by uh, that module. So basically, finishing the general part of the presentation, we have four basic 
parts of the system. The malicious domains discovery engine, that part in the beginning I talked about, which is um, something developed in this project, something relatively new, just a new source of URLs. The boring part, job management, storage, internal communication, and so on. These are things that are uh, very important, but not particularly interesting, and mostly solved because we're based on the Honey Spider network uh, infrastructure. Uh, then the detection modules, which we will discuss in detail. And of course, the graphical user interface, which has to be designed for this project uh, for these users. So um, we're getting to the part where we present the different modules. And I will take just one of them, the child sexual abuse material detector, simply because there's no one from NetClean in our team here. So someone has to say something about it, but it's not something any of us do. It's a ready-made solution. It works already. But there's one problem about this type of material. We're not going to deploy, in this project, we're not going to deploy uh, the system at law enforcement, uh, at a law enforcement agency. It's going to be deployed at the university and used by law en employment uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, and if they are satisfied with that, they may then, then deploy it themselves. So, if it stays at the university, it's a very special case, because if, if we keep content that we have automatically downloaded, which we already know is child sexual abuse material, we're criminals. As long as we don't know that, well, it's a huge scale crawling attempt, so who cares? Oh well. But as soon as we've identified it as it, well, the laws about possession may apply. So that's why we're not really going to store that kind of material. In this case, we just have the hashes and uh, uh, have the URLs. Let the law enforcement agencies deal with that. Of course, that may mean that by the time what we find gets checked by the law enf uh, enforcement officer, it may be gone. Oh well, too bad. How do we search for this type of material? Well, that's a secret of NetClean. But uh, remember, as I said, this is sometimes very difficult to define, so it's a problem orders of magnitude more difficult than the notoriously difficult problem of image recognition. So. Basically, we're talking about simpler things, detecting materials already known, based on hashes, for example. And I think that's the end of my part. So let's say something about the core of the system. Janusz? Uh, first, I'm going to add something about the CSAM technology detection, detection technology. Uh, I was uh, discussing this with, with NetClean and what they do. They have a huge database of signatures of uh, child abuse material, and they have speci spe specialized appliance that will be used in our system that uh, sniffs the network traffic and de de detects the files that match the signatures, and that's, uh, that's how they block it. Uh, but this is only one of the modules of our system. Our system is based uh, on our earlier product. I work for the security, te security projects team at CERTPL, uh, which is a part of NASC. And uh, <coughs> one of our e earlier products is uh, HANA Spider Network. And this is what we based our uh, design of Ilbuster of, uh, on. Uh, okay, what is uh, what is Hanai Speeder network? It is a spe specialized modul modular network crawler that is able to tra to crawl uh, specified URLs for contents for files for JavaScripts for Flash embeds, and then runs them through uh, through detectors of maliciousness to detect detection modules that there are uh, low interaction, low interaction honeypots, there are high inter interaction honeypots, 
And in the course of uh, Ilbaster creation, we will build three, together with University of Cagliari, we will build uh, three new modules, which are CSAM detection, which will be quite complicated, and I get to it in a moment. It will be counterfeit merchandise cell detection, and it will be phishing detection. And the HSN already detects malware on via use of Cuckoo high interaction honeypot, and by use of tag low interaction low interaction honeypot. Okay. Uh, we, we decided to use uh, HSN because uh, it's our product, so we like it. But uh, basically, it's a joke, joke, of course, but basically because it is highly configurable. It is not a simple crawler that does wget of, of a URL, but uh, you pass an URL to it, you can pass referrer to it, and you can <coughs> define how the contents of the URL can be processed. It is uh, example workflow from uh, your secure presentation that was focused on the HSN. I'm not here, I don't want to, for you to understand how, what's, what's on the slide, but only to see what is possible, what kind of flows, we call them flows or workflows, are, are possible to define within HSN. And what we are doing, we are, uh, we are, doing, uh, we are creating new flows with, along with new modules for HSN, to act uh, as a core of Ilbaster. Uh, we, are, we have to do that because uh, as, uh, as a part of the project analysis, we have re received a lot of very detailed and quite complicated requirements. Adam already said about the CSA, CSA material illegality, but uh, the first requirement we had was that uh, every uh, th th that we had to save every page uh, that was, was processed through Ilbaster, but we had to save it in two ways at once. We had to save everything that was downloaded, everything that uh, was a part of the page, like the HTML, the CSS, the, the JavaScript, the Flash uh, modules, and so on. But we uh, we'd also have, had to have to save the network packets and stamp, uh, stamp, stamp everything with cryptographic signatures uh, for proof that it was not tampered later. So we had uh, to use uh, web client module of the, of the HSN, which, uh, which, is, which is basically a file grabber and downloads the contents. And the downloaded content will be archived and will be analyzed by the low interaction, honey, low interaction honeypot and then maybe the URL again will be passed through high, inter high interaction honeypot, high interaction honeypot, sorry. And uh, analysis of the, the results, results of this is analysis uh, will be combined into a score if the page is malicious or not. Uh, another requirement we have uh, is that uh, we are not p allowed to gather information on, on individual European citizens. So if we have, uh, if we have uh, IP address uh, of an individual citizen, we are not allowed to display it, we are, <coughs> we are not allowed to process it as it is. So every, uh, every IP address in the system will have to be anonymized for the normal work and only after the report for prosecution will be generated that we, it may contain the actual IP address. And uh, there are small, uh, small uh, requirements like every user, which means uh, law enforcement officer that has, uh, when he first, lo first logs, in, in, logs in into the system, has to uh, mark that he read and understood, uh, understood terms of service. And uh, in the end, the system will not automatically submit cases for the police to prosecute but every detection has to be conf confirmed by the uh, police operator that it really contains uh, CSAM, that it is, it is a bad malicious page or there is a phishing or counterfeit sale. Last thing I'm going to say is to say a word about earlier part of the presentation because it is quite, inter oh, sorry. It's quite interested on 
Daj mi laser. Laser. The last thing I'm going to say about the uh, architecture is uh, how, we are, how we are going to detect uh, CSAM as, as we are not allowed to, to download it. I said before that we are going to download every contents of the page for Archiva reasons. And this traffic will be going through the CSAM detection net, cl net clean device, which will talk to the rest of the system if it detects uh, CSAM material. So uh, it, it can be imagined that uh, we, we run a wget or CURL tool with proxy set for the uh, ICAP, NetClean and ICAP appliance. And in the appliance gives us a specific error. We know that there was material, CSAM material at the URL. Uh, it was. Uh, it is due to legal reasons. We are not allowed to, down, to download it, so we have to detect that there was a CSM material at the URL, and we have to be sure about it. And that's, I think, uh, everything about the system architecture for now. Gina, please. Okay. Thank you, Janos. Uh, okay. Then. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just. Uh, a note about my name, Igino Corona, from the University of Cagliari, Italy. And um, um, my, my research interests are, um, I'm a postdoc researcher, and uh, my research interests are within uh, the field of machine learning and computer security. So basically, <clears throat> we try to exploit machine learning techniques to develop uh, practical systems that uh, are may be used to <coughs> secure, uh, to, to solve some security problems. And uh, uh, in particular, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the following slides, I will present you um, uh, some systems that we, are, we have developed and we are still uh, improving um, that will be applied to the Hillbuster platform. And um, uh, the first one is uh, the fusion detection uh, uh, system. Um, it, you may see in this slide uh, a picture of um, a PayPal uh, page. How do you understand if it is uh, phishing or not? Basically, you, you cannot. Or is a Practically impossible in this case. It's in the exact copy of uh, the true page. Okay, basically in these situations or in situation where <coughs> the page is looks uh, has some uh, similar aspects to uh, legitimate pages, the only thing you can do automatically, I mean, is to detect the source of the web page. So basically, you may uh, at first you have to detect that this, it is a, a, a candidate phishing web page, and uh, it looks similar to a leg legitimate page, so a PayPal, PayPal uh, web page. And uh, after that, if you look at the source of the page, it it is completely different from the true legitimate page of PayPal, which is from this autonomous system. Okay, so this is the basic mechanism we applied to our prototype to detect phishing web pages. So we detect phishing, a special kind of phishing web pages that that has some similarities with known, uh, well-known web pages like PayPal, Facebook, um, Google, uh, and uh, and so on. So if we detect. <coughs> Uh, candidate phishing web pages that look similar to known legitimate pages that are within our database and have been has, have been validated by a human operator. Um, a machine learning system is capable to detect that it is similar and then look for the actual source of information. So autonomous system, basically uh, the network from uh, from which uh, the pages is generated. Sorry? Wow. Okay. 
So this system is very uh, conceptual con uh, from an IAG level point of view is uh, pretty simple. I will not go through the details, but uh, I think it's pretty clear how it works, the system that will be deployed in the Ilbuster uh, platform. Anyway, uh, later on, we may, you may ask me if you need uh, more information, or more details. The other uh, system we are developing is uh, a system to detect this kind of pages, at least uh, uh, pages that try to sell um, illegally pharmacy uh, medicines that should be, for instance, that may not be sold online, or if they may be sold online, they are sold without any medical prescription. So they are illegal. As Adam said previously, uh, the concept of legal, illegal is somewhat different b across different net, uh, countries, but uh, um, from uh, an, an European point of view, uh, these pages are illegal. So what is the basic uh, uh, concept here? A pharmacy selling web page is characterized usually uh, by, by some uh, uh, features. For instance, it contains a shopping basket, uh, uh, customer care, pharmacy products, obviously, it advertises products, products and uh, has a lot of uh, shipping methods or payment methods. Okay. And uh, how to distinguish uh, legitimate between, in between legitimate and illegitimate pages? I already said that. Pharmacy products are so, uh, may not be sold uh, are sold online, but they may not be sold online normally. Oh, and uh, if they are sold online, uh, they are sold without any kind of medical prescri prescription. How do we solve the detection problem here? Remember that our system wants to uh, let um, to um, uh, allow law enforcement to quickly. That, um, uh, have a look to uh, website that that um, with high with uh, confidence confidence are related to uh, this kind of scam. So basically, uh, there's a crawler that tries to find candidate web pages that probably sell pharmacy products, but then there um, there is a, a detector that. Uh, analyze the, the 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 actual content of the web pages and, and determine with a high accuracy according to our experiments we we are we, are, we have been able to obtain very few false positives. This is important to allow law enforcement to uh, focus on real really important web pages in order to uh, <clears throat> save time. And uh, okay. So basically, also in this case, we use machine learning techniques. We use document categorization uh, techniques based on, uh, currently are based on textual content within, within the page. But basically, it may be based on, on, on any kind of content within the page, images, uh, uh, flash content, and so on. OK, let me switch to another. Uh, system that we developed within this. Actually, it was uh, previously developed within um, a research project um, between the University of Cagliari and, and University of Georgia, USA, uh, by me and uh, Roberto Bertici, which is, uh, who is uh, a current professor within uh, professor at the University of Georgia, USA. And um, uh, it is uh, uh, one of the building blocks of the uh, project. Um, uh, so the, this system is uh, uh, capable to detect fast flux networks. Who, who already know, uh, knows uh, fast flux networks? Is there someone? OK, one? OK. Let me just uh, tell you that fast flux networks are a special kind of botnet that allow to host malicious content with very, very high reliability. So basically, uh, cyber criminals use uh, compromised, typically use compromised machines 
uh, bots that have a public IP address and associate a single domain name, for instance, www.google.com, obviously google.com is legitimate, but a single domain name may be associated with a thousand of different IP addresses. This means that you basically have no chance and new domain names, new malicious domain names are registered the, on a daily basis. So you have, we, we have no chance basically to stop this threat, but in, um, we may detect them and uh, con counteract. If we are capable to detect such kind of networks, domain names and IP addresses, we may provide for blacklists automatically. We, do, we did that with a system which is called Fluxbuster, and we are currently monitoring uh, uh, a network of, uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, ISP providers in Italy, which is called uh, Tiscali. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a snapshot of uh, the out of the, our system that uh, provides uh, some information about a cluster, a network detected, the domain names associated with the network. This is a fast flux domain name. And uh, the, the, a list of IP addresses associated with the network. Basically, these domain names may be used for any kind of illicit activity. I mean, phishing web pages, uh, malware command and control, um, any kind uh, of uh, illicit activity you may think of. There's no limit uh, to the uh, cyber criminals' uh, imaginations. Imagination. Okay. So, okay. so basically, this w this system will be um, in, pra in practice works. On uh, by just monitoring DNS traffic, and uh, the interesting point here is that we don't, don't need to collect uh, confidential information. We just need the authoritative DNS DNS replace from uh, uh, collected in the network. So basically, we don't need to know who performed the DNS query. Okay, this is an important aspect when you try to de develop practical systems because sometimes you need to collect information which is confidential and you are not, cap uh, in practice, you cannot deploy the system, okay? Okay, um, let me give you a final, uh, some final note about the project. It, it is expected in 2000 and uh, uh, next year, basically, okay? And uh, we expect to, uh, we are, we are uh, uh, optimizing, the si optimizing the system so, such that we are uh, capable to uh, process uh, at least 10,000 10, uh, URLs per day. And uh, we are, we are, uh, um, we plan to um, evaluate the system together with uh, Polizia Postale, uh, uh, which is um, uh, um, a well-known well law enforcement in Italy uh, in the ET in the ET infrastructure. And uh, okay, it is important. It is, this aspect is, has been highlighted also by Adam that the whole project is within a, a legal framework that allow, allows law enforcement to really use the outputs to perform um, uh, the investigations. Because sometimes you may have uh, information that uh, uh, legally cannot be used by law enforcement, okay? This is uh, uh, kind of important when doing something that uh, can be uh, uh, re really useful uh, f to fight cybercrime because um, it's, uh, some information may, may be collected, but if, if it cannot be collected legally, maybe also law enforcement has problems with their investigations. Okay, so Final slides. Um, we are still looking for other partners 
that uh, uh, are willing to join the project freely, I mean freely uh, without budget. But uh, what, what is the incentive? For instance, we are looking for uh, uh, networks, organizations that are willing to share DNS data in their networks. As I said previously, it, is, it is, uh, doesn't involve any confidential information. But in turn, we may, make, we may give them this, uh, the, our detection results. I mean, uh, a blacklist, a dynamically generated blacklist of domains and URLs that are um, that is generated by the, our system, by the whole infrastructure. Okay, and uh, we are also looking to other law enforcement uh, uh, operators to test the system. Okay, so. Um, I think uh, this project is uh, is uh, interesting because uh, um, law enforcement sometimes are uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, uh, if you are interested in this project or you have other um, specific uh, uh, questions, uh, please ask me now. But uh, anyway, you can contact this email address here and ask for uh, uh, any other information. And so that's it. Any questions? Curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. I have, I think, a few comments and one major question. Um, is that uh, it was Tech Law Center or Tech and Law Center? That's a that's an American uh, entity providing. Okay, because I, I see a few, yeah, I see a few weak points in your... Milan, okay, because I, I see a few, a few dangerous points in, in, in what you said. Um, the first one would be you said that uh, you can't download CSAM material. Uh, the reality is, at least in Poland since May, you can't even look at it. You don't have to, you, n access is now illegal, not downloading. You don't need to possess it to uh, be actually criminally not liable. Actually, to have a look in a f at it in, in the browser, you need to download it, so it technically... It's, a, it's the same thing, perhaps. But the point is, uh, the system will not download C uh, CSAM because it will be blocked by the uh, NetClean appliance. But you don't need to. Access is forbidden. It's 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 the new law since May, so you got to take. What do, what do you define by access? Just by well, making yourself aware of the material, whatever you uh, you wish to define it by. You don't have to possess it uh, on your hard drive for it to be legal. So uh, that's point number one. Uh, point number two about the personal data processing, that is also dangerous because just blanking it out on the operator screen, again, does not absolve you of, of it's still processing if you have it. You again, don't need we are to working see it. in an Italian uh, law framework, okay. not, in, not in Polish or American. You, okay, you are. Okay, that's interesting, but it should be the same because we're covered by the same European rules. But uh, so, no, but it's not the same. But on the other hand, uh, IP addresses are not always personal data. If you just, it's an IP of a server, that will not. Yeah, be I know that. Data. We can go over and talk over the coffee, the actual case. Okay, so I should just uh, let it go then, right? Then I will skip the third question because it's purely philosophical about uh, whether you're afraid that this research might lead to some. Uh, abuse in the future, for example, being implemented as a, as yeah, a censorship course, layer on the network itself. If, you, if you're too successful with your machine learning, uh, aren't you afraid this could be used for, uh, for things that you did not plan it to be used for? Just a short comment. Uh, actually, if what you're trying to do is censorship, you don't need that. This is like using a heavy truck to get to work. 
all you need is a crawler and uh, a few regular expressions. So I can, I can, could, I won't, but I could create a censorship solution for you in two weeks with a couple of guys. It's, it's an easier problem than we're dealing with here. So I don't think that's the problem we should, uh, we should be thinking of here.